Uh, and so without being able to do that with all of our young people, we really just have a select group into this group. So it's the advisory group, the parent advisory group, a host of administrators and staff. So my apologies for those who are watching and uh, all the remaining security measures are in and it's now code protected. Anyone else that wants to participate though, they will be able to see it later because we are going to record it and post it for the uh, general public. I'm gonna turn it back over to you with the uh, remaining time that we have to pick back up uh, with overall information. You were explaining why schools were closed and then jumping right into those questions. Thank you right. again so much and my apologies. Oh, no, it, you know, it, it's curious because I was just discussing with our staff, we had a virtual staff meeting at the Kansas Health Institute today and uh, we have been advised by our IT consultant to uh, try to find alternatives to Zoom when possible because this kind of situation was becoming more and more common. So I never heard about that until this morning and that the next thing I know we are in the middle of it. Um, anyway, I, I don't want to take more time than needed, but in, in terms of background, but uh, essentially that is my role as county health officer is to uh, take measures necessary to protect the health uh, of the people in, county, in Shawnee County. And the law gives the health officer the authority to uh, restrict individual freedoms, uh, put people in isolation and quarantine, uh, restrict movement of people, and uh, restrict public gatherings when necessary. So that's the authority under which that order was issued. And then a couple of days after our order was issued, the governor announced that there would be a statewide uh, uh, order to close the schools for the remaining of the year. So that uh, state order, of course, take precedence over the local order. Um, regarding the questions, uh, uh, I had three that you sent me, would you like to, for me to try to address all three of them, or is there one in particular? Dr. Anderson, you have muted, I think. We'll start off with the student questions, and I see uh, Caitlin Shima is actually in the space, and, and so rather than me restating a student's question, um, we'll unmute uh, Caitlin's mic and allow for a student to ask the question themselves. I think they'll still be right in alignment with the three questions that we sent in. We also see uh, one of our parents as well that's on the line. But uh, Caitlin, uh, the question that you would like to pose, the one question within the space, we're still gonna stay within that 30 minute time frame. So Caitlin, I'll turn it over to you to ask your question. Uh, I was just wondering about uh, what you do as far as national, um, like are you connected anywhere with the national uh, health organization or World, World Health Organization, or is it more local in Kansas? Well, my role uh, uh, technically is local. Uh, my connections are much broader than that. Uh, uh, before I uh, took over this um, role as county health officer, I was working at the state of Kansas as chief state epidemiologist there. And before that, I was working uh, um, with the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. And I still have those connections. So a lot of what uh, we decide to do here in Kansas is based on the best available evidence that we have nationally and uh, frankly, internationally. I mean, we look at what's happening in other countries, as a matter of fact, I, I happen to be an Italian, and so I am following very closely what's happened in Italy. I have family there, I talk to them, I watch the Italian news, the, the original broadcast in Italian. So uh, the decisions are local, but the base for those decisions is global. And so Dr. Pazina, one of the questions what, from our young people were, was that young people may not be taking this seriously. You've already explained why we're closed. And so the question that uh, our advisory group asked, uh, they were taking it seriously, but why should this be um, important to young people in terms of the impact uh, and the possibilities if it's not taken seriously, what could we be facing? Sure, let, let me try to address that. But first of all, let's debunk the myth. Uh, I'm young, so this is not going to affect me. That is totally wrong, totally false. Uh, what is true is that older people are more likely to have a more severe disease. That doesn't mean that young people will not have the disease. It does also doesn't mean that young people will not have a severe disease. As a matter of fact, data from New York, you were asking if, if, if uh, uh, we look also outside of our community. I can tell you the data from New York City 
showed that uh, about 30% of their hospitalized patients are young adults. Um, so that, that's a pretty high number. So myth number one, it's not true that if you're young, you won't get the disease. Uh, in fact, we had one uh, uh, very, I believe it was one death in Kansas. Well, it wasn't very serious. It was one death in Kansas in a young, uh, young person. I think she was 14 or something like that. The second element to consider is that even if you are young and not uh, sick, you may still carry the virus. Those are the people that we call asymptomatic carriers. So asymptomatic means without symptoms and carrier means you carry the virus. And whenever you carry the virus, you can transmit the virus to someone else. So you need to think long and hard. If you wanna be the high school student responsible for walking around town and uh, uh, associating with your buddies and your partners and their families, and then uh, being the source of these people becoming infected and sick because you were infected yourself and you didn't know. So these are the two main reasons uh, why this really matters for young people. First of all, you may get sick, you may get really sick, you may end up in a hospital, and number two, even if you're not sick, you may make other people sick. That you, you, you probably these are your loved ones, your your family and your friends, and you probably wouldn't want to do that. Thank you. The other question was regarding the best ways to stay healthy. I mean, what uh, you know, we hear we initially heard about hand washing, but now there are other things that are out there in terms of groups. And so, what are the uh, advice that you can give one? for young people, but also for people at work who are essential employees, payroll and other folks that are handling papers and passing out lunches. So what are some um, uh, advice that you can give to both staff and students in that regard? Yeah, uh, let's take a few of them just in order of uh, effectiveness. At the top is just stay home. It's just as simple. Remember the virus doesn't jump and doesn't walk. The virus moves from one person who has the virus and person who's infected to another person who doesn't. So if we break the contact, we break the ability of the virus to be transmitted to other people. Um, if that is not possible, you know, because of, uh, you know, the, 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 you, you are involved in essential activities or, uh, you know, you have to go to the grocery store from time to time, there are a few other things to keep in mind. Keep your social distance. So try to stay at least six feet away from anyone else around you. That applies anytime you are outside of your house. That applies if you go out for a walk and that is actually allowed and recommended. You can and you should go out in nature, in, in, a, uh, in a park, just take a walk around the block. That, that's not only allowed, but recommended. You are not under house arrest by your means. You just need to stay away from people. So even when you go out for a legitimate need or a legitimate reason, just try to keep this, that, that distance. Of course, there are cases where that's not possible. You know, if you're at work, uh, you have to do certain tasks. Uh, I would argue there is still, there are probably many tasks that people may think that can be done with a safe distance of two or six feet, to about two meters, six feet. So try to be creative, try to create the distance. If you need to exchange objects, the best thing to do it is to, you know, for one person to put an object on the table and then step away and the other person goes and gets the same object. Um, then there is hand washing. That is absolutely critical. There are two ways for the virus to get into our body. One is by breathing the virus in. And that happens when we are exposed to cough or sneeze from somebody who has the virus because that's how you know, the, the, the droplets that are generated, the little things that are generated uh, when we cough and sneeze contain the virus. The second way to get infected is through our hands when our hands touch our, what we, what we call the T area. So the two eyes, the nose and the mouth because the virus can penetrate through those surfaces. The virus does not penetrate through the skin, but it will penetrate through the eyes, the nose and the mouth. And so if you touch something that is contaminated with the virus, then your hands are contaminated and then you touch those three surfaces. That's when the infection may happen. It's very hard not to touch your face. I know, I, 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 I was surprised myself because when this thing came out first, I was well, okay, I'm not touching, oh my goodness, I'm touching my face. Um, so it takes some training, 
but definitely awareness is the, 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 the first step. You need to know that that's one way to um, prevent the infection. So don't touch your face and wash your hands as much as you can, as often as you can. Wash your hands. If you're at work, wash your hands. When you arrive there, wash your hands when you leave workplace and then wash them again when you arrive at home. So there is not going to be too much hand washing ever. Gloves, in my opinion, are not very helpful except for some specialized circumstances, you know, some special cases. But the problem with gloves is gloves are more important when uh, uh, there is a contact infection that is transmitted directly from the hand, say, to food, for example, something like that. Or when the, the um, pathogen, the agent, can penetrate through the skin, then having some gloves is important. But in this case, that's that's not happening. And it, when people wear gloves, essentially the glove can become as contaminated as the skin of the hands, no more and no less. And then uh, on top of that, when people put the gloves on and particularly take, take them off, they may accidentally contaminate their hands, but then they have this false sense of security. Oh, I have gloves, so I'm okay. And that's not gonna work. So the best thing for me is always water and soap. I wish we didn't run out of toilet paper and we ran out of soap at the grocery store because that would tell me that our message is working, but uh, we still need to work on that. Thank you. Uh, the other question, uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to one of our DCAC parents, um, our advisory council parents, uh, Mr. Gruder, Ivan Gruder, I know he's on the line. And if there's a question from a parent perspective that you'd like to ask, I'd like to yield the floor to you. And the same with uh, First Lady Hicks, I'd like to yield the floor to you if there is a question that you would like to ask. Mr. Gruder, is there a question that you'd like to ask? Oh, and I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Gallen, uh, can we make sure that we unmute Mr. Gruder as well as uh, um, if Ms. Hicks has one, we'll unmute her as well. And we'll, um, I don't have a question, but I do appreciate all that, um, doctor, for being on this call right now and the information that you're giving us. This is excellent information for us to pass on to our, ourselves and then to our young people. Sure. Thank my, you. My pleasure. And we'll unmute uh, uh, Ms., uh, Reverend Gruder. He's unmuted. All right. So, Dr. Gruder, you want to unmute yourself as well? And I think you've muted yourself. So if you click it again, we'll see if that works. Yeah. And we'll remute uh, Ms. Hicks, uh, First Lady Hicks. Having all this control is kind of crazy, uh, I know. Dr. Zeno. I know, muting and unmuting. I, I can only imagine. Be, being there, that. done that. <laughs> yeah, so we'll, uh, uh, First Lady Hicks, if you can press mute on yours, because I think you have your own controls now. And then we'll turn it over to um, our Reverend Dr. Gruder to pick it up from here. Thank you very much for being here and being part of this. And thank you, Dr. Anderson, for hosting us. Uh, what's the best way to teach some of our younger children, our kindergarten and first graders, what they can do about the virus and answer their question, uh, what is the virus? Hmm. You know, that's a very interesting question because I never really thought about how to speak about this with very young people. And I'm sure there is a lot of people smarter than I am that have probably published volumes on, on, on the subject. Um, the easiest way to describe a virus is something really very so small that we can't see it, but it does exist. And if you have, a, a, I think most children understand the magnifying lens concept. And you know, if not, you can just show the magnifying lens. Look what it does. And then uh, I would probably tell them: Imagine if we had a lens really about this big, so so big that you wouldn't even fit in this room. Then you will be able to see something as small as a virus. So. They are there, they exist, and they are so small that they can come into your body. Uh, now, the other thing I would say, because I really don't want to, 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 for these children to start having nightmares, uh, is that our body, most of the time, is very good at fighting those intruders. And uh, they will just kick them out, and, uh, and that works most of the time. But occasionally it doesn't work, and that's when we become sick. And the best way that we can avoid that is to prevent that little thing from getting into our body. And that's where the hand washing and the soap become so important. And then try to turn that hand washing process into something fun. Let's sing a song and we keep washing our hands until the song is over, something like that. I heard that happy birthday has the exactly the right, I think happy birthday tw twice has exactly the right length. I, I don't know if there is a science behind that, but, but you get the concept, just 
try to make it something a little more fun than just washing hands. I thank you so much. It is 2.30 at the end of the hour. I don't want to neglect anyone with this small group. I have a couple of more minutes if, 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 if you do, if you would like for me to stay for a few more minutes. And so Mr. Gowan, I don't know if we can unmute all folks in this space since we know it's a, a selected group of people that we've invited. And if you are not speaking, just leave yourself muted. If you, uh, now that he's given you the controls, if someone would like to ask a uh, a question right now uh, in terms of any of our staff members in particular, um, anything that you'd like to still have answered, now's a great time to ask that. Ms. Foster, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Uh, she's one of our teachers and instructional coaches and speaking on behalf of college prep students. And um, if there is a college prep student, I think Ms. Foster is probably going to relay what question you might have. I think Ms. Foster is still on mute, so we'll wanna make sure she's off muted so she can ask her question, Mr. Gowan. And Ms. Foster, you may have the controls yourself to unmute yourself as well. If not, then I guess anyone else on the call, if you have a question right now in the interest of, uh, of time, uh, now is the best time to just type one in and ask that. I actually have a question. Okay, and is that Kyra? Yes, it is. Hello. Hello, Kyra. She is a ninth grader at Highland Park High. Hello. I'm on college prep. Um, but I did have a question. I saw an article and I looked up uh, just to double check and verify that it's actually true uh, about there being a second wave of coronavirus starting up in Hong Kong. And I was wondering how concerned we should be about a second wave possibly coming into America because so far current trends have been following from there. And, and Dr. Pazino, when you talk about that, can you talk about the peak as well? And the, again, when we talk about the importance of staying home and good practices, the potential of a peak as well as that uh, answer. Thank you, Kyra. Right, right. That, that's a very good question. So uh, regarding Hong Kong, uh, I, I don't think that's true as far as I know. I haven't seen anything uh, coming out of Hong Kong that would indicate that there is a second wave now. Uh, we're still in the, very much in the middle of a first wave as far as the United States is concerned and, uh, and Topeka and Shawnee County. And what that means is that if, if you think about the number of cases as a line, that goes like this and then it starts going up and then it goes higher and higher and higher and then it becomes almost vertical. That's a kind of curve that usually we experience when there is an outbreak of coronavirus in, in any community here in the United States and elsewhere. We are still in that ascending stage where the line is moving from flat to almost vertical. We don't know how vertical it's gonna be. The, steepest, the steeper the line, the harder it's gonna be because it means there are more cases in a compressed period of time. The goal of our staying home and all the other measures that have been recommended is to make the line less sharp. So hopefully we will have fewer cases, but perhaps even more important, instead of going like this, the cases will go like this, progressive, and then it will come down. What that means is that uh, we, will, we, we, we will be in a better position to take care of the people who get sick. And these people will not have to struggle for healthcare because that's the real concern. That's what's happening now in places like New York City. So the question that everybody wants to know is when are we gonna peak and then come down? I wish I knew. Um, all we can do is doing some modeling as people call it, which is essentially predictions. It's like making a weather report based on the best evidence you have, but nobody can really guess what the weather is gonna be like because there are so many different variables uh, that are involved, right? We, we try to make a, a, a forecast, but it's not a prediction of what's gonna happen in the future. So our forecast so far looks like uh, Kansas will peak probably around April 25th. That's for the state as a whole. We still do not have any solid model for Shawnee County, in part because we haven't had many cases. Shawnee County started a little later than other areas, uh, especially Kansas City area. But we don't know if that means that we're gonna have to go through the same cycle. And so since we started later, we're gonna end later, 
or maybe some of these control measures that we took early on will enable us to compress our total curve, if you will, in a shorter period of time. Uh, we still don't know. Uh, for practical purposes, I think I would anticipate that all the measures in place will remain in place until about the end of the month. And then uh, uh, probably the last week before the deadline, we will reassess the situation. We look at all our elements that we can use to make the forecast and decide if we need to do anything more. The last element about uh, the virus coming back, there is some real concern that the virus may come back in the fall. And many viruses have the kind of behavior. They disappear in a certain season. Usually they are more prevalent in the cold season, they disappear in the warm season, and then they come back in uh, the cold season again. We don't know yet if the coronavirus is going to behave like this. Maybe, maybe not. It is possible, but it's not sure. And, uh, but even if it does, uh, the prediction is that the second wave wouldn't nearly be as bad as the first one for two main reasons, real quick. The first one is that there will be more people with immunity, meaning people have been infected already. And so now they have developed immunity so they can't get infected again, at least for the time being. And second, we will have more time to get ready. So our hospitals will be in a better situation to uh, treat the patients and our public health departments will be in a better situation to identify the close contacts of the people who were infected and put them in quarantine. Thank you. Uh, there are two final questions that came in um, and one was texted in. Uh, one uh, is in regards to uh, a reliable source where you might suggest people go to so that they're not following false information, but the most reliable source of information that you feel like uh, they should use. That's one question from a member in the group that was sent uh, privately to another member in the group. Uh, the other question uh, that came in uh, is in regards to um, um, the community, uh, the current community. Uh, there's been talk about potentially uh, school not being able to be in session in August or September. And, and the question is, is uh, that a potential based on um, a second wave of the virus or the virus reoccurring? Is there possibility of um, in the fall there being a need to uh, have some protective measures in place basically is what the question is getting to. Yeah, so let's start with the first question. Uh, for local news, or for, or for uh, yeah, local news and, and, and information, I think the best place to be would be the Shawnee County Health Department website. I don't have the exact URL with me and probably if, and if I tell you, you will misspell it. But if you Google Shawnee County Health Department, you will find it and on, uh, uh, it's part of the county system. And so on the homepage, there is actually very prominent a link to all the coronavirus information for Shawnee County, including a pretty interesting dashboard that shows the current, it's updated twice a day, the current number of cases, how many are hospitalized, how many are, uh, have been discharged and so on. Uh, there, are, there are other good sources of news. If you wanna to go to national level, I, I would recommend the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC it has a, a wealth of information, both for uh, professional people and for the public. The second question about what's gonna happen in the fall, it's way too early, it really is way too early. Um, I, uh, I, like probably many other public health officials these days, am very reluctant to say this will never happen because I never thought that I would ever have to sign an order to keep potentially the entire Shawnee County at home. And, and I, I just did that a week ago. So we are in uncharted territory, as people like to say, we don't know. I will tell you what my hope is. My hope is that we are gonna have the situation that I was describing a moment ago, where even if we have more cases, they are not going to be as as quick and fast uh, as 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 we are experiencing now, and our healthcare system is going to be in a better position to treat them, and our public health system is going to be in a better position to attack the second wave of the outbreak, so that such severe and and drastic measures like shutting down the schools, keeping people at home, may not be necessary. But the key word here is may and hope. All right, we thank you so so much. If there are other questions that people have, I know, uh, Caitlin, you sent in a question, and I believe one of our staff members, but we want to also be respectful uh, 
uh, Dr. Pazino's uh, time, as well as with the initial interruption. So again, we thank you for being here with us today. We're gonna post all the questions and answers. The final two questions that were asked were more about, are there areas in the community that have greater uh, numbers of cases than others? And the final question, uh, but I'll just attach the map that is already out there in terms of the spread across Kansas. Uh, and then the final question from Caitlin. Um, Caitlin, you picked us off to begin with. So uh, we were going to shut it on down, but do you have a, a question you'd like to ask really quickly to just close us on out coming from a student? Um, and then um, I see your question is about using soap and he was talking about soap. So we're gonna end it off with you. You go right My on. My favorite topic. <laughs> um, so I have with me an Italian exchange student. This is Francesca. Ciao, okay. Francesca. Come stai? Um, she would like to ask you in Italian. <laughs> certo, dimmi. Ha importanza se usiamo il sapone antibatterico per lavare le mani oppure no? No, not really. Uh, can I, uh, posso tradurre? <laughs> the question was, it's, is it important to use antibacterial soap? Uh, the most important thing is to, hope, to use soap. Any kind of soap will do. The, 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 the most bacteria and viruses will not resist more than 10 seconds, 15 seconds of good, energetic, hand rubbing and soap. Just, they won't. Sapone normale, sapone di Marsiglia, quello che hai, qualunque cosa. What a great way to close out. My goodness. Again, thank you so much for your time uh, and thank everyone you. who has participated. Have a great, safe uh, rest of your week and weekend and to everyone else as well. Have a thank safe you. Uh, weekend ahead. Remember, you're safer at home. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.